last webinar for the year. Um, my name is Sean van den Berg. I'm an investment specialist at PSG Wealth. And uh, you can see there by our topic today is always have your trading seatbelt on. So the reason for that, uh, you can also see the image there. I think a lot of us just want to get away and uh, enjoy our holidays. But uh, the main thing today is to focus on uh, risk management, um, especially in trading. Last month we spoke about the trader's mindset. But just to give you some context, um, uh, any uh, entrepreneur or business owner wants to establish, call it the financial stability and promote continuous growth. And one aspect of doing this is to reduce costs um, and increase revenues by adopting a strategy known as, uh, uh, call it loss prevention, um, which is a pro proactive risk management technique uh, so uh, likewise, and this is why I'm using this image today, is uh, uh, likewise very much like a seatbelt in, uh, in a car. Uh, you as a proactive uh, investor or um, uh, trader obviously want to protect uh, yourself when you're driving in a vehicle and also try driving, driving in the markets or <laughs> trading in the markets. So the whole idea is to protect uh, your capital against unforeseen uh, threats and so safeguard your assets, uh, but also to maintain a secure investment environment. And, and this is the whole context for today. So um, there's, here's the, I call it the agenda for today. And uh, again, that little uh, image here, just to, to remind you, obviously, uh, protect yourself, uh, keep your hard, your hard hat on especially in the markets, um, especially with, with the volatility and the uncertainty we're having at the moment. Um, so yeah, uh, three little points again, um, uh, making sure you, you bend the odds in your favor. And uh, then we're going to talk more to the investors, how to spread risk, uh, we're using diversification and portfolio structuring. And then for the trader, how to use stop loss and position sizing. Okay, so I'm just gonna grab some water here quickly. So just the, uh, just to kick things off, there's two um, sayings that really get to me. Um, number one is uh, ignorance is bliss, and the other is knowledge is power. So the way I look at it is uh, ignorance, <laughs> when it comes to money, ignorance is not bliss. You know, ignorance is not bliss because it leads to poor decisions, poor actions, and obviously terrible consequences that can uh, obviously have a negative impact on the quality and quantity of your life. Um, so that's the one thing. So when it comes to investing and um, uh, trading, um, uh, you can't say that you, you're ignorant, you didn't know, you have to learn about these things. So uh, talking about that, uh, knowledge is power is the other one that really grates me. Knowledge is potential power. That's why I look at it. You know, it's, it's only potential power. Uh, it only becomes power when and if it's organized into definitive plan, call it a plan of action, and directed to a definite uh, end. So the way I look at it, knowledge uh, helps you obviously solve problems. So this just gives you some context in what I want to talk about today. So making sure the odds are in your favor, the, the whole idea there is to um, start off on the right footing. You know, getting started in the, uh, in the market as an investor is a daunting task, especially if you're a complete novice. Um, and um, if you're a methodical person who's cautious about commencing anything as such as important as as uh, um, acquiring uh, the sufficient knowledge and expertise and confidence, all those kind of things um, can um, uh, stop you. Okay. So the, the whole idea is that uh, you know you, uh, you can create a short list of the things that you you might want to uh, 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 a checklist rather. Uh, of the things that you might need to uh, add on that list, but you talk to 10 different investors, you'll have 10 different items on that, that checklist. So what I'm trying to do now is just to help you um, as a starting point with, um, we'll call it my little checklist, um, but it's mostly focused on key, uh, call it personal attributes, but also the, over, the overarching uh, strategic framework uh, that will help you, in, our, in my opinion, that will help you become more of an uh, intelligent investor. Okay, so um, betting odds on your favor, uh, and we've discussed this over many webinars before, you know, set clear investment goals, investment objectives, have a financial plan in place, uh, we've touched on that before. Understand the, co the power of compounding, you know, long term, how the money works for you. But also in today's context, there's no the potential risk. Whatever investment you're going into, do your homework. You know, I know it sounds uh, 
uh, very simple. The people don't do it. They just jump in boots and all. Uh, so I understand the potential risk of any kind of investment, you know, and we'll be dis discussing this in a bit more detail in further slides, but also know your risk tolerance. I'm amazed how many people get involved in the market and they're very, very conservative. Then the stock market is not for you, you know. Um, you can't go into the stock market if you want to preserve capital. There are risks involved. Uh, we'll touch on those again just now and link to that as I just said now. Do your research. Research the investment vehicle that you're looking at. You know, a, share, a share trading account is not for everybody. You know, maybe a unit trust account is much better. Uh, we call it a voluntary investment plan. Um, and so, yeah, and we'll go into that in a bit more detail. And the whole idea is also, you know, if you're looking at a share trading account, there's costs involved compared to a unit trust account, they're much lower costs. Um, we'll be touching on, on diversification and asset allocation. These are all the things that you need to know to bend the odds in your favors to help you make money in the markets. And I always say it's not about making money only in the market, it's also avoiding capital losses, and that's a focus on today. So um, we'll be discussing some strategic or so, uh, uh, classic investment strategies. And we have, again, we've touched on in previous um, uh, webinars. And the whole idea is if you're thinking long-term as an investor, you have to be disciplined, Stay, stick to your plan. Yeah, uh, and link to it very closely, educate yourself continuously. There's so many books and so many websites and so many courses you can do. Uh, the more you know, about a certain share or sector, the better your odds are. Um, or betting the odds in your favor of making money. It's the same thing with investments in general. Educate yourself, you know. Um, and it's, lastly, you know, seek professional advice, you know, seek professional guidance. Um, it just, just gives you that peace of mind. You know, we've spoken about it before. We spoke about an acronym, uh, SWAN, S-W-A-N, sleep well at night. And that's ultimately where you want to be as an investor. Okay. So, um, why do people lose money in the markets? Obviously, the main thing there um, as investors is trying to time the market. Um, who can remember back last year, March, um, March 23rd, uh, 2022, when the market took a, uh, took a bit of a, a knock, and this whole COVID thing. Uh, that was the bottom of the market. Um, you know, uh, it was a 32% 30, 30, drop. You know, a lot of us uh, would have missed getting into the market at a point in time. I remember Sassel was trading at 20 Rand a share. Uh, it was knocked down to those levels. So yeah, try, trying to time the market is not uh, uh, ideal. Not many people can do it consistently right. As an investor, yes, you want to bend the odds in your favor. We'll be discussing it a little bit, a bit later with some charts and things like that. But as an investor, um, you know, timing the market is not as easy you know, um, as, a, as it might sound. Buying bad companies, this is where a lot of people get it wrong. Buying uh, companies that got no growth prospects, no, uh, um, you know, the, the, the share price is dropping because um, the company is losing money. It might be, uh, you know, it might be in the declining industry. It might be overvalued or a better competitor comes along. Uh, but the main thing there is, you know, the share was once upon a time 50 Rand and it got to 5 Rand and now it's 50 cents. There's reasons for that. <laughs> And a lot of us will go and try and buy these little penny stocks, hoping it to go back to the same levels again. Now, nah. okay, uh, people lose money also when their time horizon is too short. You know, as an investor, buy and hold is your strategy number one. But also, when, more importantly, you sh your time horizon should be at least three years plus. If you're buying a share and you're holding it for three years, then capital gains tax applies, which is much lower than income tax. So if if, if you're in and out the market more often and, and you're losing money, maybe because you your strategy is wrong. You, you're more of a trader than an investor. Um, you're too concentrated. Uh, you, you got all your eggs in one basket. Obviously, the, we could discuss this also a bit more detail just now. You need some portfolio diversification. And also, if you're too emotional, you know, as I said just now, the, the stock market is not for everybody. Um, you know, you can't be conservative, and 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 every time the market drops, if your share price drops, your shares drop a bit, you want to sell because uh, you think it's going to go down further. That's too being too emotional. Um, but again, the market might not be for you. And then using the wrong investing style. You know, some of us might be value investors. Some of us might be uh, growth investors. Some of us are investing in the market for the dividend income. 
um, but also, you know, uh, active versus a passive uh, investment style. You know, active is managing a share portfolio, whereas a passive investment are opening my money with a fund manager and a unit trust. So all those kind of things you have to take in consideration. Okay, so as an investor, how do I start managing that risk? And there's two main ways of doing it. Number one is obviously uh, diversification and the other is uh, structuring the portfolio. So what attracts more people to the market is obviously the potential for high returns compared to putting your money in the, in the banks, okay? Uh, but that comes at a price. That price is obviously associated with uh, share market movements. Um, so the general rule of thumb here always when it comes to, to returns or, uh, and risk, uh, the higher the potential uh, return, the higher the potential risk. So they go hand in hand with all investments. Okay, so it's essential. There's some some questions you need to ask yourself, and this is also helps you to uh, decide if the stock market, direct share market, is for you. you now, is the potential return worth the potential risk? Um, what are the chances of me losing money in this investment? So, if you get your timing wrong or wrong in the market, yes, you're going to be losing your money. Um, so, it, it all works on this. Uh, you know, the, the 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 degree of risk. Is a function of the probability that the actual return received will be less than the, the return uh, the um, uh, return expected. So the more volatile return, the more concerned one will be about the downside move. So yes, direct share market investment is very volatile. <laughs> okay. Um, so there's two kinds of risk you get in the market, and we broadly we call it a systematic risk. This is the risk that the whole market will crash or fall. And then what you call unsystematic risk is risk specific to a specific share. Okay, so um, as I say, there's two strategies, or there are some strategies that you can use. Um, and uh, first of all, obviously, as a classes, you as an investor, you want to diversify your investments across various asset classes, you know, and those classes include shares, uh, well, I call it paper money, uh, 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 paper, so it shares, so this is um, equity in public listed companies or JC listed companies, can be bonds, can be uh, real estate. So this is actual tangible uh, physical land uh, in building natural resources and things like that. Um, you can also look at things like exchange traded products, uh, that, that would be exchange traded funds and exchange traded notes. Uh, these are just baskets of securities that allow you to follow better index or commodity or sector, can be listed property, um, can also be things like uh, government bonds and obviously international markets and things like that. Uh, and obviously in the same thing there, we talk about unit trusts. Okay, that can also be, uh, again, a, a class of, of, of investments. Commodities, this is uh, basic goods like, uh, that, uh, that you use to produce other products. So in this sense here, we always talk about gold, uh, and silver and platinum, um, you can also refer to them as also in, on the ETF space, but that falls into the paper side. So we're talking about in this situation, commodities would be more like the Kruger Rands, tangible Kruger Rands uh, and, and those coins and things like that. Um, another uh, as a class would be cash and, and short-term cash equivalents. This is having a savings account and money in the bank account. It can also be things like a money market account. Okay. So it's all shorter term, low risk uh, investments. So those are all the different asset classes. Okay, now you're very linked to that, as you can see the next point there is tangibility. Um, something like uh, a physical property or a house would be a, something tangible, you can touch it, okay? Um, whereas, uh, as I said, shares are, yes, you, uh, in the good old days, we used to have share certificates, now everything's digital, and as I say, uh, what I call paper. Um, so I know a lot of people that they are uh, hoarding. I might use the wrong word. They're hoarding uh, Kruger rands at home, and they might some keep some cash in their safe. Uh, there's a lot of uncertainty and volatility in the markets. Okay, and then linking to that is obviously you want to diversify um, in, in different uh, sectors and different industries. Um, I remember when I first started out in the share market, my background has been in the hospitality industry. I used to specialize in the beverage and hotel sector. Those days we used to have Sunbop and Sunsisk and uh, there was all the, the, the uh, food companies like Wimpy and obviously Spur. Uh, but, but, but it was all concentrated in one sector and then from there I diversified into other sectors. 
Okay, so it's the same thing here. You want to start with something you know and then diversify into other sectors. Um, when you're developing your share portfolio, I always say to people, what share, what, uh, who do you bank with? Uh, be it EPSO, First Rand, uh, Standbank. So you like that bank. So that's one of the first shares you want to have in, in your in your in your in your portfolio is a, is a banking stock. Um, who, who do you have insurance with? Old Mutual, Sunlam, Metropolitan, whatever the case might be. And so you start building up a, a diversified diversified portfolio. Then linked to that also, as I mentioned just now. Uh, are you a value investor? Are you looking for bargains or are you looking for companies that are growing faster than its peers? Yeah. So those are two different uh, styles, uh, investment styles you might want to use. Uh, you know, I incorporate both into my portfolio. I have some growth shares and uh, some value stocks. Um, some of the more of a, and that's the next point here, market capitalization. The large cap stocks like your big blue, blue chip shares, um, you know, they... Uh, they give great dividends and I might not growing, maybe growing as fast as a growth company or green chip share, um, but they're still giving you dividends. You get that regular dividend income every six months. So market capitalization is also important to look at the size of the companies. You're looking at companies, uh, when I say large caps, this is usually the top 40. Um, these are the big companies that are, um, you know, not essentially giving you massive returns, but they have over a long period of time have increased in value uh, but also, as I said, the consistent dividend payers, uh, examples of some large cap companies would be Discovery and Aspen Pharmaceuticals, uh, ShopRite, just to name a few. Uh, there's an old saying we have in the market, elephants don't gallop. So those are the large cap companies. They might uh, uh, plot along, grow consistently over a period of time, but paying the dividends. If you look at NASPAS, that's the largest company on the on the JSC at the moment. There's a capitaliz market capitalization. The size of the company is over $632 billion. The smallest company in the market is Sable Exploration. Um, it only has a market capitalization of about 566, 565,000. Okay, so consider the vast operational differences between NASPAS and Sable Exploration. Each company will have consider, consider, considerably different um, approaches to, to raising capital, introducing new products into the market, uh, brand recognition and growth potential, all those kind of things. Then we look at mid caps, this is the next 60 companies um, on the top 100. So these are companies that, uh, um, you know, they, they the process of expanding, that's why I call them the green chip shares. These will be companies like your your clicks and your spas and things like that. So, um, you know, they, as I said, they, they have more room to grow um, and, but uh, obviously the larger cap companies, the blue chip shares um, obviously might be a bit safer. And then we look at the small caps. This is anything I call anything outside the top 100. Um, these are a bit more riskier companies. We can call them red chip shares. Um, but um, obviously, um, you know, they, uh, the, the, these little companies that are trading at much lower prices and a bit more could be a bit more affordable for the man on the street. So that creates the demand and the share price jumps up and that's what attracts a lot of people to just understand obviously small caps are riskier. Uh, but small caps once upon a time, the big shop right once upon a time was a small cap, grew and became a mid cap. Now it's a big large cap. So yeah, the opportunities there. Risk profile, you know, again, you want to consider investments like a fixed income account, uh, fixed income uh, securities like bonds and things like that compared to a, to a share trading account, like different risk profiles. And your risk profile yourself, your risk tolerance as to match your investment. And then the last thing you want to look at, you know, uh, local investments in local JSC shares or offshore shares. Uh, um, a lot of people want to move their money offshore because they're worried about things here in South Africa. Yes, it's diversifying your your assets geographically is very important to look at that. But one way also to to gain offshore exposure is through uh, exchange traded funds. You can have expo exposure to the S and P 500. You know, there's um, um, Satrix uh, is the brand. As uh, Satrix and core shares have uh, the S and P 500. Satrix also has the exposure to the Nasdaq. Um, uh, 100. You can also have exposure to um, offshore shares itself. Like if you want to have exposure to sh to Apple through your local share trading account on uh, exchange traded notes. Uh, FNB has launched a whole lot of what, what we call um, uh, Quantos. Uh, it allows you to track the uh, uh, globally listed shares like F uh, like um, Apple uh, with or without currency exposure. So it's another way of just getting exposure. Um, 
yeah, so those are some things to diversify your 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 money into a whole lot of different investments. Okay, so uh, that is a starting point. So let's talk about portfolio diversification. So this is one of the most basic uh, principles of a, of a sound investment uh, strategy. Bottom line, you want to put all your eggs in one basket. That's what it means there. Yeah. Okay, so you want to spread your your capital, your funds. Um, into uh, various different shares and industries. The whole idea is to limit your, your risk or uh, your vulnerability to adverse market movements in one share or sector. I'm amazed how many people have all the money in gold stocks, for example. It's crazy, you know. Um, but also the whole idea is to protect yourself against a general market slump. So the idea here also is to, um, you know, the more, you have, the more you, the shares you add to your portfolio, the better. So I've, a lot of people start out and they only got 5,000 rand. You can't really diversify your, your your portfolio with that. Rather go to unit trust. You're buying into a basket of shares or buying into ETF. You're buying into a basket of shares. So as your number of uh, as you increase the number of shares in, in your portfolio, the risk declines to a lesser extent. Okay. So if one share in your portfolio, you got a 100% chance. Uh, if something happens to that company, you will you'll be affected. So you add a second share your risk reduces by 50%. Add a third share and so it goes on. Okay, you can see there on my slides. And when you get this presentation, obviously go into more detail. When you get to around about 15 shares, um, you see you're dropping down to about 6%. Um, when you get to about 20%, it gets to about 5%. When you get about uh, 30 shares in your portfolio, it drops to about 3%. Uh, 40 shares in your portfolio, about 2.5%. And, and you drop to about 50 shares, you've got about 2% chance of that share having a big impact on your portfolio but then you might also have a unit trust okay so the big it's a big trade-off between uh, reducing risk and spreading your time too thinly doing the doing the research if you if you have between uh, 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 about 15 shares in your portfolio spread between uh, between three and five different sectors okay um you're you're, you're managing risk so the few then uh, you know you can go as low as five but then as i always say you know you you have to watch that basket very closely. So uh, if you've done your homework properly, yes, it comes with time and experience. Uh, you will maybe have a concentrated portfolio. Um, yeah, but uh, less than that, you're, you're really having un uh, unacceptable levels of risk. More than that, obviously, as I said, it becomes unwieldy. You have to spend time analyzing and keeping up to date with all the information about those shares in your portfolio. So the next one that comes to this is another dimension called portfolio structure. So we, with the diversification, we're looking at spreading your risk between different shares and different sectors. Yeah, we're looking at quality and, and your time frame. Your time frame. So it also helps you to understand how much money you're going to put in any particular share. You, know, you might be too conservative. It might be too risky for one stock. You know? So just a general broad, broad thumb. Uh, your bulk of your portfolio, you'll see the next slide as a uh, as an idea. A bulk between 50 and 70 percent of your shares into the large cap stocks, a long term view. Um, these are the safe long term shares, um, and obviously, those are companies that, uh, as I say, they're the elephants in your portfolio. They're not galloping, but they'll give you your consistent growth and consistent dividends. So, between 20 and 40 percent, you might want to put into some growth stocks or green chip shares with a three to 10 year view, um, and then obviously, allocating less funds to the more higher risk. Uh, red chip speculative stocks. Okay, so here's an example. Uh, you can structure your portfolio. Uh, one of the ideas always, I, I always like the idea of keeping some money in cash um, in my portfolio. Obviously, you could also get some some income coming in from dividends. The reason why I, know, I want to have some money in cash, if an opportunity comes along, um, I don't want to be in a situation where I have to sell one of my shares to take advantage of the new of the new opportunity. So uh, hopefully just having a, a, enough cash and dividends and things like that, we'll be able to um, add or uh, a new share to my portfolio. So that just gives you a quick uh, idea of a portfolio structure. Then we come to the traders very quickly. I'm running out of time here. Stop loss and position sizing, two most important things to look at. So uh, again, the reasons why traders would lose money, risk, uh, lack of risk management, and we began to talking about that, emotional trading, uh, greed and fear, no place in the market. And last month we spoke about um, mindset, um, how to control your mindset and things like that. Over trading, you know, buying and selling, buying, buying and selling daily, uh, you can't do that sustainably every single day, it will be killing you. 
Okay, and then position, pure position sizing, and it's also just following the hype in the markets and, and media. Those are some of the reasons why people lose money. But uh, let's talk about stop loss. So very simple uh, 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 idea in the market is uh, you buy something at 10 Rand, straight away you say to yourself, how, how much am I prepared to lose? Uh, well, it's just a rule of thumb, you have 10%, so 10% on, on 10 Rand is one Rand or 100 cents. So you value your shares down to nine Rand. So that's your stop loss level, that's your safety belt. If the share does not go up like you predicted, it drops to your stop loss level, what are you gonna do? You're gonna sell. One thing you must acknowledge, your timing was wrong. Okay, that's why I look at it. Okay, but let's say, for example, you get your timing right and everything's honky dory. There's demand for the share, the share price goes up, so the share moves up to 15 Rand. Your stop loss is still 10% of the current share price, which is 1 Rand 50. So you're valuing the shares down to 13 Rand 50. If it drops to 13 50, you're out. Okay, you're still making 35% on, on where you bought it at. Goes to 20 Rand a share, your stop loss is 2%, sorry, 10% or 2 Rand. So now it's down to 18 Rand. So the bottom of the cycle, you're minimizing your losses at the top of the cycle, you're maximizing your, your returns. Okay, that's a very simple, what we call a, a, a trailing stop loss at 10%. So yeah, on the, on the uh, Viewpoint uh, trading platform, there's a facility there called uh, uh, Stop Loss, where we call it a contingency order. Um, uh, the trailing stop loss, it's called trailing, and obviously you se select a, uh, a percentage. So rule of thumb as I'm, I'm working here is, is 10%, but that's, that's the idea that you set the stop loss. And as your, as your stock broker always, we recommend if you're trading, always use a stop loss. Okay, so yeah, very important. And then position sizing. Um, this refers to the position uh, within a particular trading account, but also call it, call it the, the random amount that you're going to trade uh, 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 each position or each trade. So it helps you determine how many shares. You'll see in the next slide how, how we get to that. So um, rule of thumb again, 2% rule. It just uh, helps you to uh, work out. If you've got 100,000 Rand, 2% is, you're not going to risk more than 2,000 Rand per trade. That's what it means. So you've got that Rand, that Rand value. So that's the most you're prepared to lose is 2,000 Rand or 2%. Okay, so here's an example. So I'm using an example here of Capitec. So Capitec's been on my watch list for a while. I've been watching it and uh, I see it's, it's bounced uh, off some support levels and uh, some uh, uh, broken up above a, uh, call it the resistance trend line. And all these things come together. So I've got a high probability trade, I can call it that. So you can see also from our oscillators, the uh, uh, right at the bottom there, you can see the stochastic. You see uh, yeah, in the beginning of November, that uh, made the cyclical high, so what we call a bullish divergence. Uh, that would have alerted to me too, first of all, uh, to it, and then secondly, to that, it's bouncing off that support trend line, that support level, it broke up above that uh, resistance trend line, so you can see my little red circle there. So that would have been my entry price, around about 1,640 Rand. Yeah. So if there's three prices you always need to know. You need to know your EP, your entry price, your stop price, and your take profit, uh, take profit price. So in this scenario, I look back and say, okay, what is the previous cyclical high or pivot high? And it was around about 1,840 uh, Rand. So from there, I can start calculating my risk reward ratios. And where would I want to put my stop? My stop in this situation would have been the, the, the previous low, uh, the previous support that way at the, at the bottom there, 1,555. Okay, so those are three numbers I already worked on. So you can see here, um, and again, Okay, I've been talking about shares all the time. I want to introduce a, uh, a, a derivative here called a CFD, Contracts for Difference. I just find it's more capital efficient to use CFDs. Uh, I'm still using 100,000 Rand. You can see my, my starting capital there. But just more, from a trading point of view, it's more capital efficient and obviously more cost effective. Your, co your brokerage cost is only 0.4% plus VAT. So it's much more cost efficient and, and more capital efficient. So enterprise, going back to my scenario there, was 1,640. My target price was 1,840. Uh, my stop loss was 1555. So from there, I can work out my risk between my entry price and my stop loss uh, is 85 Rand. Okay, so my risk reward is uh, is 2 Rand, uh, sorry, 200 Rand. That's between my, my take profit price and my entry price, it's 200 Rand. So now from there, I can calculate what they call a risk reward ratio. I'm willing to risk 85 Rand to make 200 Rand. So my risk, risk reward ratio is one point uh, to one point, 
2.36. Okay, I'm willing to risk one rand to make at least over two rand a share. Okay, so my potential uh, reward, I always just do this for myself, is that 200 rand as a percentage of my entry price is 12%. Um, as a percentage of my margin, remember this is the top 40 stocks, I, I bring down roughly about 15%. Um, so I, I have a potential of making at least 81% of my margin um, at 15% putting down. Okay, so coming to the position sizing, if I've got 100,000 Rand, remember I said 2% of that is 2,000 Rand. Now I can take my stop loss. This helps me understand how many shares to buy. Um, so my stop loss, my, or the risk rather, was 85 Rand a share. Divide that into my into my 2,000 Rand, and that gives me 23.5 shares. Okay, round it off to about 24 shares. Uh, the current share price is 164, uh, 1,640 Rand a share. Um, it gives me three or four shares. My exposure, I'm putting down roughly about 39,360 Rand to have the, the or that's exposure rather. Um, because it's a geared product, I need putting down an initial margin of 15%, which is 5,594 Rand. Sorry, 5,904 Rand. So it gives me gearing of, of, of 6.67 times. That's why I said it's capital efficient. I don't have to lay out 39,000 Rand. I put only bring out 5,000 Rand. Okay, so that's where uh, position sizing helps me determine how many shares to buy uh, from uh, from this whole experience. Okay, so going back to my chart, and you can see the share price actually went much higher. Okay, went all the way up to 11990. So you can see it moved up very, very strongly. Let me just put my little cursor in here. It moved up very strongly. So what I've already done, is that yes, I could take my profits here, would have made my nice little profit, I would have been happy, but also I could have said, okay, let me move my, ent my my stop price up to my entry price and then ride it a bit higher. Yes, it's become a very overbought, uh, you can see from the, in the indicator, but let's say we rode it all the way to the top here, okay? In this scenario, you'll have seen that uh, your risk reward ratio is still the same, I've just, uh, uh, now I'm locking at 350, 350 rand profit, but my my stop loss is 150. Okay, so it still gives me 21% um, over my my entry price, which would not be been so slab, uh, shabby. So the whole idea is you do all these paper, all these uh, uh, calculations before you start to trade, and that helps you uh, uh, minimize your risk, gives you that peace of mind. Okay, so I hope that uh, helped you guys a bit more. Okay, so guys, I'm running out of time. Let me just go to the next slide. Cool. So in summary, okay, the main reason why people lose money, risk, uh, 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 lack of risk management, uh, diversification and structuring the portfolio on the investment side and on the trading side, I'd say it's more stop loss, uh, but also position sizing. Okay. Um, so bottom line there, you can see there, it's not only about making money, it's avoiding capital losses too. Cool. So let me see what kind of questions you guys got. I'll show this very quickly. Uh, let's my little screen now. Uh, <laughs> Vessel, you always ask the same question. When will there be a technicals for trading? Um, I don't know. Uh, it depends on Sorrel. Um, we're just running out of time. We're, we're just very busy, Vessel. Um, yeah. I know it's been on our, on our time thing, it's, it's been for a long time. Cool. One out of con, you hear me? I'm sorry about that one. I don't know why. Some people can, some people can't. Um, don't know. So, yeah, let me see. Uh, any other question? He has a question from Jan. Jan wants to know um, what's the tax implications on trading CFDs? Yeah, there are tax implications. Um, the resource looks at it as a derivative. Um, and yes, uh, you'll be adding your profits um, to your income tax. Um, but as I said, yeah, it, it is uh, your cost is much lower uh, and things like that. So, yeah. So yeah, sorry on the, the tax implications, but you're making money. I'd rather have 50 rand in my pocket than not have 50 rand in my pocket. <laughs> okay, Demba wants to know: Does PSG have a trading simulator for CFDs? Demba, no. Okay, Naomi, yes. The presentation as as well as the recording will be sent to you. Okay, great. Uh, hopefully by tomorrow or Friday the latest. So, sorry, Tamer, let me get back to your question here. Does PG have a trading simulator? We used to. Uh, we dropped it. Um, the whole idea now is you open up an account um, and then start trading small. Uh, one way of looking at it, and obviously, uh, 
Uh, another way of looking at it, do some paper trades, open up an Excel, Excel spreadsheet, and then have uh, what I call what if scenarios. <laughs> okay, I just find in the past with a, with a trading simulator, it gave, gave a lot of people a false sense of security. It wasn't real money, the guys became cowboys, there was no emotionals involved with real money in the market. These guys did not want to pull the trigger and want to trade. So that's one of the reasons why we dropped it. Here's a question from um, Joan. So what's the minimum amount to trade CFDs? Uh, there's no real minimum. Uh, just understand that the minimum transaction value uh, on the system must be 25,000 Rand. So 25,000 Rand uh, transaction value times 15% initial margin. So the minimum, I would say, is 3,750 Rand. That's what we call initial margin, uh, Joan. But obviously you need some um, additional funds because a variation margin, margin. Uh, on a top 40 stock, you need 3,750 rand. The next 60 companies, the mid caps, you need 3,375. Uh, 3, sorry, 4,375. Um, yeah, the, the challenge with, uh, with small trading amounts, yes, you're starting small. Uh, position sizing doesn't apply. You know, if you got 10,000 rand, 2% of that is 200 rand. You won't be able to calculate how many shares to buy. So you only be using stop loss. So yes, you can start trading of 10,000 rand, but um, yeah, you have to do it quite actively. It might be fun, it's money you can afford to lose. Um, yeah, but uh, ideally, I'd suggest 100,000 rand if you want to really become serious about making money uh, and from trading. Cool. Now to clock all the questions. So uh, we're going to conclusion here so yes we spoke about two products today mainly a share trading account and cfds um, you can click on that little link there says click here it takes you through the key information document understand what you're getting involved with that's what it's all about okay and then um, you know as i said the webinar recording as well as the pdf of this presentation will be uh, sent to you soon but from my side happy trading and good luck any questions you guys are welcome to contact me by email wealth at phd.co.za as well as uh, the, the one stream line there, 0868 But from my side, thank you very much for being on the webinar. Thanks for your support uh, throughout the year, and uh, we'll see you back in January. Cool. All the best. Bye for now.